Somebody just shout Jesus right there. He always guides me. He always guides me. <laughs> Through mountains and valleys. Mountains and valleys. <laughs> His joy is refreshing. His joy is Say your spirit, your spirit lives within. Me. So I will walk so in your peace. I will walk in your say it again, your spirit, your spirit lives. Now say this, my victory, my victory, my victory. My victory. Say your spirit. Good morning, Rocky Fork. How are you today? This blustery, hot morning, I'm glad you came inside to cool off a little bit. We've got the air turned up for you, so should be good, yeah. Those of you at home, uh, you'll have to adjust your own air conditioner, but we're glad that you're here too. And uh, it's a great day, though. It's a good day to be here, right? And we are excited to start this new sermon series today, The Way Forward, right? And looking at what we can do. And if you are here for the first time, if you're joining us for the first time this morning, or online with us for the first time this morning, we want you to know we're just ordinary people. Ordinary people that struggle with things, that are wrestling through this season that we're in. And it's difficult for all of us, but there is a way forward. And it's through Jesus Christ. And we're going to be looking at Him and His life, and what we can learn from Him and His testimony. And we're going to do that together. And we've been challenging you to pray, right? To pick one person. One person that God has placed on your heart that you can be praying for this year, that they, would, that they would be introduced to Jesus, that they would learn who He is and come to know Him and understand the love that He has for them. And we're going to keep challenging you to do that. I want to keep asking you and inviting you to pray with us to have that one person on your mind every day and take that a step further. Start thinking about how you can maybe invite them for a meal 
to your house to have a conversation. All right? Ask them if they want to go to lunch on a lunch break during the work week. Meet you early for coffee. Maybe you just take a, a cup of coffee and a donut to their place of work and just drop it by. Just let them know that you love them. Start to build that relationship because relationship is where it all starts with Jesus. He builds that with us. Don't forget to be praying for them. Now, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor, okay? You have to stand up for this part. So stand up. If you're at home, stand up. Okay, we love the Missouri weather, right? These zero degree days are awesome. A little snowfall. When the snowfall comes, it changes things for us here in Missouri a little bit. It just alters things, and it alters things that you wouldn't even realize. Like, you may not know this, but uh, our drummer, Dustin, one of our drummers, Dustin, he drives a plow truck. So when there's snow on the ground or the roads need treated, that alters some of our plans, right? So the band is going to need you this morning to bring the energy and the excitement to the room, right? We're not going to have that guy back there crashing on the drums. We're going to need you to bring that energy and excitement. And here's how I want to challenge you. Has anybody got plans for later this afternoon? Has anybody got plans? Okay, right? Cheering for the Chiefs, right? Can you imagine? I would just, just imagine for a second. Can you imagine if we were in Tampa right now? How exciting that would be. Can you imagine that later this afternoon, if we walked into that stadium and instead of limiting it to 20,000 fans, it was packed full, a sea of red, Chiefs red. Can you imagine that excitement? Okay. You'd be there. You'd be, you'd be cheering the Chiefs to victory. You'd be celebrating their victory. But we have a greater victory in Jesus Christ than any football game. A hundred years from now, I don't know if we'll remember this Super Bowl, but we'll still remember Jesus Christ. So as you sing with the band this morning, bring that energy, that excitement before God. None of us None of us like to dance, maybe some of us, but put your hands in the air. Cheer, celebrate the victory in Christ. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for letting us be here today. It is a beautiful day because it's a day that you've made and you've allowed us to be a part of it. I pray that we would celebrate you today, that we would shout your name, that we'd hold our hands high knowing that you have victory over sin. And because of that, we have life in you. We pray it in your name. Amen. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory.
fight in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty
haven't gotten a chance to grab your communion yet, I encourage you to do so. Those of you who are watching online, do the same. You may have a seat. Scott Rice is going to bring us our communion meditation this morning. Good morning, church. 
you might think that this communion meditation might involve some sort of cheese for reference. It won't. <laughs> we'll have plenty of time for that later on this afternoon. No, this is quite the opposite, actually. This is just a remembrance of something where we need to set aside all those other things of life and remember what this moment's all about. And in the Restoration Movement churches, which we're part of, it's a tradition that we take communion each Sunday. And sometimes that can be real familiar, and sometimes familiarity isn't a, isn't a good thing. But this is what Jesus asked us to do for a reason. When Paul talks about it in Corinthians, he says that you have to realize that every time that we eat this bread and drink this juice, that our words and actions reenact the death of our master Jesus. This is a reenactment. It's like a, a living nativity scene or, a, or an Easter passion play or something like this, but it's within us. We're reenacting what happened that day on Calvary. And every time we do that, we need to consider what happened there and not let it be too familiar. We need to reconsider who it was that was hanging on the cross and what that death meant for you and me today. So this is why we do this. Just a minute to stop thinking about things like the chiefs and our jobs and our life around us. And every week be reminded what that was all about. Because that's what Jesus said. He says, he goes, this is my body that was broken for you and this is my blood that was shed for you. And he says, do this to remember me. So that's why we do it. Set aside all that other stuff and remember what happened that day. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we'll never appreciate what that must have been like for you. But I and these people in this room and around the world and for generations can thank you for what that was and how that has changed our lives. And God, we want to remember that. We don't want to get distracted. We want to focus on that at this very moment so that we reset our thoughts. It's in your name. Amen. Good morning. Man, aren't you glad you're in here? All right? It is some kind of cold out there. Hey, we are starting a brand new sermon series today called The Way Forward. You'll be seeing this type of uh, introduction to our sermons for weeks to come. So uh, this sermon series is going to be leading us all the way up to Easter. So if you haven't thought about it, that's really not that far off, if you think. I mean, spring is just around the corner. 
It didn't feel like it this morning, but it's just around the corner, right? In a world that seems like everything is going in the wrong direction at times, right? Sometimes it even feels like it's going sideways, like it's no direction whatsoever. We're just slipping and not going anywhere. We felt like it'd be a really good idea to study the words, the red words of Jesus, right? The, the red words of Jesus, especially in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 14 through 17. Now, let me give you a little background about this piece of Scripture, this section of Jesus' life. These are the last teaching moments of Jesus. They, they take place in the upper room. You've heard that before, right? If you've been around church for a while, you know what the upper room is. It's, the, it's where they, they do their, their Lord's Supper. It's that last moment where they're celebrating the Passover together. All the disciples are present. They're all there in the upper room, and something is going to happen that night. In fact, Jesus is going to be arrested just hours after supper in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the next morning, he will face trials, and later in the day, he'll be hung on the cross. I mean, that's how close we are. That, that's, where, that's the setting, that's the physical and the geographic location. They're in Jerusalem, in the upper room, sharing a meal together. Now, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the physical location, that's the historic geographic location. Now, the what's going on in their hearts that's where you and I are going to have some things in common. You see, Jesus has been talking to them, and their emotions are high. They're feeling fear. They're overwhelmed with worry, with what might happen next. Jesus has been saying some things to them that, that really are bothering them. He's been talking to them about the hard stuff. He's preparing them. He, he's wanting them to be ready to navigate what is ahead of them. But in that, there are some very tough talks. He's told them he's going to die. Not once, not twice, but three times. And he's reminding them. He even says in, in John chapter 13, verse 33, he says, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just if I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. Now, these are words that Jesus is saying before he leaves, right? He's telling them, he's warning them, he's giving them advance notice, preparation. I'm leaving, you're going to look for me. You won't find me, and where I'm going, you can't come. Now, they've been with him for three and a half years. This is going to be, they have left everything. So when Jesus is unplugging from them, there's the separation anxiety, right? You get that, right? Anybody who's ever said goodbye to someone knows exactly what I'm talking about. How many times have we told our kids, right? They, they've asked the question. You know, maybe you're getting ready to go to work, right? And you, they say, can I go to work with you today? No, you can't go to work with me today. It's not safe. <laughs> it, it's, not good. it's not a good environment for you, right? And, and besides that, uh, you're really going to be underfoot, right? It's not going to be safe. So no, you, you can't go with me. And I, I think that that's kind of what Jesus is saying here. Uh, and they're saying, we want to go with you. And he's saying, you can't. And like little children, he's saying, you can't come today. It's really important that we study this together. A lot of what Jesus is telling his disciples in the upper room so many thousand years ago, is really what you and I need to hear right now in our lives today. Do, do you believe that? Do you believe that the red words can transcend time? I do. I believe the words of Jesus are just as powerful and, 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 and impacting as the, as the day he spoke them. 
Jesus wants his followers to have confidence and courage to stay on mission, to stay focused on him, and to love one another. And he wants to prepare them to struggle that's ahead of them. Because he loves us, he wants us to know him, and he wants us to know the way forward. He's giving us the map. He's giving us the power to navigate the world that's ahead of us. So there's this awkward moment in the upper room. All the disciples have come in, and, and everybody's taken their place around the table. And nobody's washed their feet. Now, get the setting, right? The setting is most people wear sandals. They aren't covered. Uh, there's probably not any socks. Uh, everybody's walking around in bare feet other than these sandals that are on the bottom of their feet, right? So you've got this dust and dirt from the roads, which also have animals walking on those roads right? So you have this smell and this funk on your feet. And they lay down for a meal around the table. Their feet are away from the table. The table's in the center of the room. They're laying down with their heads facing toward the table, and their feet are filthy. Usually what would happen is the lowest person or a servant of the household would wash everybody's feet when they came in. No one did that. Jesus picks up a, a, a basin, he picks up a towel, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet, every one of them, one after another. The Son of God is washing the feet of his followers. He's preparing them. He's giving them a hands-on teaching moment. There is no better example of this Listen to what he says in John 13, verses 14 through 15. He says, when he finished, he says, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, they would understand as rabbi, right, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Do you hear the teaching moment? I've washed your feet. There's the example. You need to do this for one another, and this is what you should do moving forward. Now, remember, the, the, the disciples are feeling this angst, this anxiety, because Jesus has been telling them, I'm going to die. I am leaving you, and where I go, you can't come. And it's like Jesus is saying to them, you can't come, not yet, but here's what I need you to do until I come back, right? Do you see that, right? There, here's what you need to do while I'm gone. Chapter 13, verse 34, 35, Jesus says, a new command I give you. Okay, we, that should perk our ears up just for a moment, right? God is speaking. God is giving a new command. Love one another. Sounds simple enough, right? Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, the, what he's talking about is, the loving one another. By this action of loving one another, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, what I see there is, can we back it up once? One, one scripture? Thank you. So you must love one another. Is that a suggestion? If you like the other person, you should at least try to love them, right? If you're friends with them, love them. Ah, I'm wrestling with this. 
It sounds like he's giving us a command, right? It sounds like Jesus is saying, surely he's not saying that, right? Sounds like he's saying you must love. Is it possible that's what he's saying? I think so. You must love. This is how people, everyone, will know you are a follower of Jesus. By your love for one another. The master rabbi, Jesus, puts their needs ahead of himself. He washes their filthy feet and serves them in a way that they have never, ever experienced before. We've said it before, love is doing what is spiritually best for the other person. It takes a lot of humility. I don't know if you've ever done this for somebody else or if you've ever had your feet washed by someone else. There, there is a sense of, I am not worthy of this. This is uncomfortable while it's happening. But once you get past that, there is an overwhelming sense of love. Some of you are thinking, right, I wouldn't show anybody my feet, right? Get way past that. These guys' feet are cracked, dirty, filthy, stinky, toe jam, you name it. And Jesus loves them. So when Jesus says everyone, who's everyone? Is everyone of my choosing, of my choices, or is it everyone, right? Is it your kids, your spouse, your friends, people you like, your boss, your teachers, neighbors? It doesn't really matter. It's everyone, right? It's everyone. It's even the person you don't like. It's everyone. And he says, they will recognize you as a disciple of Jesus by how you love one another. So I thought about it this week. I thought, you know, how do we try to portray being a Christian? Right? Because Jesus says, this is how people will know, but we've taken it another step farther in the wrong direction. Well, if you buy a T-shirt, People will know you're a Christian, right? If you put a, a fish sticker or a magnet on the back of your car, people will know, right? But that's not what he's saying. Those things don't make you a Christian. Neither does the denomination that you belong to. Did you know in the beginning, when the church was first launched, there was no denomination? Did you know that? It was the church that Jesus loved. Did you know what they called them? The way. Yeah. It begins to make some sense when we talk about the way forward, right? The way. Yeah. They, it wasn't their political. We're not identified as Christians by our our political perspectives, our, our social media posts, right? We aren't, we aren't determined Christians by how thick or how thin or how big our Bible is or if we've memorized the entire thing. I know a lot of theologian scholars that if you looked at their lives, you'd say, it'd be hard to determine if they loved anybody. You're also not a Christian by your moral righteousness or your ability to sigh or grimace when you see somebody else sinning. Whew, man, I wouldn't do that. Or, ooh, that doesn't make you a Christian. Your ability to see other people's wrongs is not an attribute. The way, the way, 
that everyone will know that you belong to Jesus is by the way you love one another. Now, I had to swallow this myself this week, right? Because this is a hard teaching. And if that's true, then my actions, my words, my posts, my rants, how does that express how I love you? My political choices, my legalistic views on whether to wear a mask or not. How's that loving you? It really comes down to the decision where I need to decide, right, that what Jesus says is more important than my own thoughts, my own leanings, right, my own thinking, that I need to be in line with him. I need to realign my life so that everything I say, every passion, pursuit I have is about loving one another. That's what Jesus says to do. Let's get back to the upper room just for a moment. Peter's going to ask the question that everybody, everybody in the room wants to ask because that's Peter. That, that's what Peter does. Jesus says, where I'm going, you can't go. And, she, and Peter says, where are you going? Right? Well, where are you going that we can't go? So far for three and a half years, we've followed you everywhere. Jesus looks into the eyes of his followers and sees exactly what many of us are experiencing right now. We don't know what's next. And Peter just verbalized it. Where are you going that we can't go? Why can't we go? We're troubled, we're anxious, we're worried, we're scared of what might or could or if it happens next, we worry. That's what anxiety is, right? Anxiety is the moment where we begin to say, well, what if, right? What if? And we begin to build on top of that what if until we get so full of worry that we're paralyzed. And those of you who know anxiety, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And this is where Jesus' final words to the confused, to the disappointed, to the discouraged, to the defeated, to the overwhelmed, takes on real meaning to each and every one of us in this room. So let me invite you into the upper room, right? Let's take our, let's take our, let's lay down around the table. Not literally, but let's, let's cozy up around the table, right? Move over, Peter, right? John, scoot over a little bit. I want to get in here too, right? Put ourselves in the upper room and listen to what Jesus is saying because he's speaking directly to us. I believe the red words are powerful and they still have meaning. And he speaks directly to you and I because he wants to show us the way forward. Listen to what Jesus says, John 14:1. These beautiful words, knowing exactly what his disciples are thinking and feeling. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. How many people have heard that before or read it, right? And one of the first things that happens in my head when I hear that, I don't know about you, one of the first things I hear when, when I hear Jesus say that, the first thing I ask is, but how? Right? It's honest, right? But how? <laughs> I'm hanging on by a thread. If I don't worry, then nothing's going to get done. Right? I don't want to worry. I didn't wake up this morning thinking, man, I really want to worry today. I really want to have an upset stomach that has a pain like right here and indigestion up in my, yeah. I really want that. I did not. 
So in John chapter 14, verse 1, he finishes with this. Here comes the how, okay? He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. There's the how. You want to overcome worry? Believe in God. Believe in Jesus. And some of you are thinking, I don't know. You know, how many people know what this is? Right? Let me introduce you to somebody. Right? I hope I hope I never see one of these again. But the word believe, right? The word believe means to trust. And maybe in a little more practical terms, it means to put all your weight on something. You see it? It's illustrations like this. Where it's pictures in our heads, right? It, I can put my weight on this and move forward, can I? Right? I was introduced to one of these for the first time in the year 2000 when I had my first back surgery. Nurse came in and said, we got to get you up and walking. Here's your friend. <laughs> right? Let's go down the hallway Put all your weight on it, and let's move forward, right? I'm sure she didn't use those terms, but the, the thought was, you've got to put your weight on it. And that's what Jesus is talking about here when he's saying, believe in God and believe also in me. Put your weight on me. Lean into me. You want to know how to get past the worry and the anxiety you're not going to find it in, in you. You're not going to find it in the worries that you can conjure up and all the things you can try to correct and, and all the control you have. You're going to find it in leaning in and putting all your weight on Jesus. And some of you are thinking right now, you know, I'm young. I don't need a walker. <laughs> right? I thought the same thing, right? Well, maybe it doesn't look like that. What are you leaning on? What are you leaning on that's not God and not Jesus? Is it money? Is it codependency? Maybe on a relationship? Is it your talents? It may be an addiction. Is it family? You're trusting them more than you should trust Jesus? That they're the ones holding everything together? If that should spin out of control, you don't know what you would do? Jesus is telling us to believe and to trust and to lean on God and on Him. In this world, we're going to have troubles. But He says, don't let your heart be troubled. You still got that confused look. In this world, there's going to be troubles, but then Jesus says, don't be troubled. Because you need to believe in God, believe also in Him. The disciples had followed Jesus for three and a half years. They had seen stuff, heard stuff, witnessed things that nobody else could know except for God or do. They saw him walk on water. They listened to him speak a word into a, a, a storm and suddenly the waves stopped, the wind stopped, total silence. It obeyed one word. They watched him with his healing hands change lives. They watched Lazarus hop out of a grave after four days of being stinking dead. Because Jesus called his name. Lazarus, come out. They know who Jesus is. And they believe in him, but he is reminding them in this moment that while the anxiety and the worries are clouding in, right, and trying to take over their minds and their hearts, he is reminding them, I am so much bigger than that. There's trouble, 
but don't let your hearts be troubled. You see it? The question for you and me is, do I believe that enough to put my trust in Jesus? Now, I know that sounds like preacher talk, right? Do you believe, right? But let's get past that but just for a moment. Let's just go past that and, and really kind of let that question kind of resonate in our hearts. Do I believe Jesus is who he says he is? Our faith is being tested right now. Do, do you know that? Our faith is being tested every day. This is kind of a gut check moment for a lot of us. What or who are we putting our weight on? Are we trusting? Are we leaning into? What or who? If it's anything other than God or Jesus... It's going to fall. You get that, right? And maybe for a lot of us like myself, you know, pre-COVID, I would have said, I believe, and I would have convinced myself, I am, I am so sold out, right? I am all in. But then this thing hits, right? And we spend a lot of time with ourselves, <laughs> right? And, and we realize I'm not who I thought I was, Right? And maybe my belief wasn't as deep as I thought it was. And for a lot of us, maybe it's went the other way. We, 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 have, we have become strengthened in this moment because it's, we've had more time. We've had more time in church. We've had more time in devotion. We've had more time in God's Word and prayer. Asking, We've been working on our faith, and it's gotten deeper and stronger. And then there's others of us who are like, I feel like I'm stuck. In fact, I've got more doubts than when I came into this. It's okay to be honest. This is a safe place. It's got to be a safe place. We can talk about real things. Real life. Listen, Jesus is pouring out in the upper room exactly what you need to hear. For the person who has been strengthened and for the person who feels like their faith has been weakened. These are exactly the words you need to hear. Jesus is giving us the way forward, a clear path to navigate life's troubles. He's offering hope and confidence, a way through the minefield and a a path to peace in a world of conflict and distrust who we don't know who's telling the truth. We don't know who to believe. Jesus is saying, believe in God, believe also in me. So what do you believe? talk for 29 minutes, right? Jesus has had opportunity to speak into your life. Let me tell you what I believe. I believe God loves you more than you will ever know. Before you were, more than you will ever allow yourself to know. The depth and the, and the significance and the mercy that rains down on you. I believe that one day there'll be no more sorrows. There'll be no more tears, no more pain. I believe that God is the God who goes before us, who stands with us, and nothing surprises him. Nothing in this world is sneaking up on him. He is in control. And he is good. I believe his grace is so much bigger than we can ever imagine. It's more powerful. I believe Jesus gives us forgiveness. He sets us free from our addictions. He restores what was once broken. He makes new out of old broken stuff. 
I believe that his love can soften any heart. I believe he can redeem anyone no matter how far they think they have gone or walked away from God. I believe there's nothing so broken that God can't restore it and make it beautiful. I believe that one day every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And that every person who has ever walked this planet will confess the name Jesus, whether they want to or not. Because someday they will know that the words of Jesus are true. Believe in God, believe also in me. I know life's troubling, but I'm not troubled, right? Like, this world is uncertain, but I am certain that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is the Son of God, and that I need to believe in him and believe in God. These things are I'm certain of. I love what Jesus says in, in John chapter 14, verses 2 through 3, and this will close up this morning. He says that my Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, Would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? The answer is no. I mean, yeah, I'm I'm going, right? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. He's answering the question that, that Peter's asked, where are you going? And Jesus is saying, you can't come yet, but I am coming back. There will be a time I have to go and get things ready and prepare a place for you. But when I come, you're going to be with me. And how many of us need to put all of our weight, all of our weight on Jesus? To trust him, that he knows where he's going. He's got this all figured out. That it's not, it's not a mystery to him. He, he's in heaven right now, sitting next to the Father, waiting for that go sick a moment. Go get your people, bring them home. I believe that Jesus loves us so much. And if we could just get past ourselves, we could really begin to love one another. That we need to know him, we need to love him, and and we need to love one another. Jesus is telling us this is the way forward. Right? Why are you looking in all the other places? I've said it. I said it in my last important minutes while on earth. Here it is. It's time for us, as we stand and prepare to sing, it's time for us to double down, to be all in, and lean on Jesus. Let's stand. Let me get my walker out of the way.